Founded in 1892, the Coca-Cola company created one of the most iconic brands of all time. Today, it's a global leader in the beverage industry with a diversified portfolio of products. Their flagship drink, Coca-Cola, is the most widely distributed product in the world. Despite being ubiquitous among the general public, investors best know Coca-Cola as one of Warren Buffett's favorite stocks. Buffett is widely considered the greatest investor of all time, so it's safe to say that his opinion carries some weight. All the historical evidence points to Coke being a generationally great investment. In 1919, Coca-Cola became a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol KO. If you had purchased just one share of the stock at its IPO price of $40 and reinvested all the dividends, it would now be worth over $10 million. However, you did not have to invest that early in order to see a significant return. Warren Buffett himself did not not start buying the stock until 1988, almost 70 years after it went public. Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway, invested $1.3 billion to acquire a then 6.2% ownership stake in Coca-Cola. Over the following decades, Coke would continue to dominate the market and reward shareholders. Without buying another share, Buffett's ownership stake has grown to 9.2%. This is due to the large stock repurchases from the company. His total Total share count sits at 400 million with a cost per share of just under $3.25. At the current stock price, that is a 1,709% return. However, that is only part of the Coca Cola story. The stock is a dividend king with over 50 consecutive years of dividend increases. In 2023, Coca Cola paid Buffett $736 million in annual dividends. That is a 56.6% dividend yield on cost. He is more than doubling his initial Coke investment every two years from dividends alone. In 1994, that dividend payment was nearly 10 times less at $75 million. The Coca-Cola dividend will only continue to grow moving forward. So far, Coke has paid Buffett more than $10 billion in dividends. He used that money to acquire stakes in other businesses building up the empire that is Berkshire Hathaway. This makes it difficult to calculate his true total return, but believe me, it's immense. Coca-Cola isn't just an investment for Warren Buffett. It's a lifestyle. He's one of their best customers. Buffett drinks five Cokes a day. Over a quarter of his daily calories are from Coca-Cola. At age 93, Buffett argues that happiness is the key for longevity. Apparently, it's not diet. Warren Buffett has stated that he will never sell a share of the Coca-Cola Cola Company. In this video, I'm going to explain exactly why Warren Buffett loves Coca-Cola stock. This will be straight from Buffett's perspective with clips from various interviews he gave over the years. It will detail the principles that make it one of the best businesses in the world. Finally, I'll analyze whether Coca-Cola stock is still a great investment now for the long-term dividend investor. The stock price is near its 52-week low, so it may be time to start buying. But first, let's roll the intro. I like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. My name is Zach, this is Dividend Data, and you should leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the video. Throughout, I'll be using the stock research tool I personally developed, which is available at DividendData.com. Here you can do deep analysis on over 7,500 stocks, helping you find better investments. Link in the description and pin comment. Warren Buffett's investment in Coca-Cola is a classic example of investing in a company with strong competitive advantages and holding long term. In 19 in 1998, Warren Buffett gave a speech at a college where he outlined several timeless investing principles. He often used Coca-Cola as a key example. In the following clip, Buffett explains that the most important part of investing is identifying a great business. Timing the stock at the perfect moment is far less relevant. Coca-Cola went public in, I think it was 1919. Stock sold for $40 a share. 
went back before that as a Candler family. I mean, they, they went back. They bought it for 2000 bucks. the whole business, uh, Aza Candler, back in the late 1880s in a couple of purchases. So now he goes public in 1919, $40 a share. One year later, it's selling for $19, going down 50% in one year. Now, you might think that's some kind of disaster. And you might think that sugar prices increased and the bottlers were rebellious and a whole bunch of things. You can always find a few reasons why that wasn't the ideal moment to buy it. Years later, you'd have seen the Great Depression, then you'd have seen World War II, and you'd seen sugar rationing, and you'd seen thermonuclear weapons, and the whole thing. There's always a reason. But in the end, if you bought one share for 40 bucks and reinvested the dividends, it'd be worth about $5 million now. And that factor so overrides anything else. I mean, if you're right about the business, you'll make a lot of money. And, and the timing part of it is, very, is, is a very tricky thing. So I don't worry about any given event if I've got a wonderful business, uh, you know, whether what it does to the next year or something of the sort. I don't buy Coke with the idea that it's going to be out of gas in 10 years, you know, or 15 years. It, I mean, there could be something happen, but I, I, I would think the chances of that are almost nil. So what we really want to do is buy businesses that we would be happy to own forever. If you're right about the business, you'll make a lot of money. That factor so overrides any short-term timing of stock price. This is a key lesson to learn. Investing is a long-term game. Therefore, you should focus your analysis on finding a business with great qualities that will win and grow for many years to come. Obviously, you still want to avoid a stock that is massively overvalued. In in the following clip, Buffett shares some of these qualities. Additionally, he shares the importance of an economic moat, a concept which he popularized. These are competitive advantages inherent in a business. He explains this concept with two vastly different examples, Geico and Disney. Finally, he connects it back to Coca-Cola and its massive advantages in the marketplace. It's a simple business. It's, it's not an easy business. I don't want a business that's easy for competitors, so I want a business with a moat around it. I want a very valuable castle in the middle. And then I want, a, I, want a, I, I want the duke who's in charge of that castle to be honest and hardworking and able. And then I want a big moat around the castle. And that moat can be various things. The moat in a business like our auto insurance business at Geico is low cost. I mean, people have to buy auto insurance. So everybody's going to have an, one auto insurance policy per, per car, basically, uh, or per driver. And, and you, you, I can't sell them 20. You know, but but they have to buy one. What are they going to buy it on? They're going to buy it on based on service and cost. Most people will assume the service is fairly uh, identical among companies or close enough. So they're going to do it on cost. So I got to be the low cost producer. That's my moat. To the extent I, my costs get further lower than the other guy, I've thrown a couple of sharks into the moat. You know, but all the time, if you've got a wonderful castle, there are people out there who are going to try and attack it and take it away from you. And I want a castle that I can understand, but I want a castle with a moat around it. If people are drinking Coke today, they drink five of them today, they'll probably drink five tomorrow. It's not price dependent, basically. Think of Disney. I mean, Disney is selling, we'll say, home videos for, I don't know, what, sixteen ninety five, eighteen ninety five, or whatever. All over the world, people, and we'll say particularly mothers in this case, have something in their mind about Disney. I mean, every person in this room, when you say Disney, has something in their mind about it. If I say Universal Pictures, you don't have anything in your mind. You know, If I say 20th Century Fox, you don't have anything special in your mind. If I say Disney, you've got something in your mind. And that's true around the world. Now, picture yourself with a couple of young kids, you know, who you want to put away for a couple of hours every day and <laughs> get a little peace of mind. And you, and you know, if you get them one video, they'll watch it 20 times. So you go to the video store or wherever you buy the video. Are you going to sit there and premiere, you know, 10 different videos and watch them each for an hour and a half to decide which one your kid should watch? No. I mean, let's say there's one there for $16.95 and the Disney's there for $17.95. You know, if you take the Disney video, you're going to be okay. So you buy it, and you don't have to make a quality decision on something that you don't want to spend the time to do. And so you can get a little bit more money if you're if you're Disney, and you'll sell a lot more videos. It makes it a wonderful business. It makes it very tough for the other guy. How would you try to create a brand? DreamWorks is trying, but how would you try to create a brand that competes with Disney around the world and to replace the concept that people have in their minds about Disney with something that says Universal Pictures? You know, so that the mother's going to walk in and pick out a Universal Pictures. Uh, video in preference to a Disney. It's not going to happen. You know, Coca-Cola is associated with people being happy around the world, where every place they're happy, where Disney World or Disneyland, where the World Cup will be at the Olympics, where every place where people are happy. Happiness and Coke go together. Now, you give me, I don't care how much money, and tell me that I'm going to do that with RC Cola around the world and have 5 billion people that have a favorable image in their mind about RC Cola, can't get done. 
You know, and you can fool around with the, you can do anything you want to do. You don't have price discounts on weekends and everything, but you're not going to touch it. And that's what you want to have in a business. That's the moat. And you want that moat to widen. You give me a billion dollars and tell me to go in the chewing gum business and try and make a real dent in Wrigley's, I can't do it. And that's the way I think about business. I say to myself, give me a billion dollars and how much can I hurt the guy? Give me $10 billion. Give me $10 billion and how much can I hurt Coca-Cola around the world? I can't do it. Well, those are good businesses. Now, give me some money and tell me to hurt somebody in, in some other fields and I can figure out how to do it. But, uh, so I want a simple business, easy to understand, great economics now, honest and able management. And, and uh, then I can see about in a general way where they're going to be 10 years from now. And if I can't see where they're going to be 10 years from now, I don't want to buy it. Basically, I don't want to buy any stock where if they close the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow for five years, I won't be happy owning it. I buy a farm, and I don't get a quote on it for five years, and I'm happy if the farm does okay. You know, I buy an apartment house, don't get a quote on it for five years, I'm happy if the apartment house produces the returns that I expect. But people buy a stock, and they look at the price the next morning, and they decide whether they're doing well or not doing well. It's, it's crazy, because they're buying a piece of the business. That's what Graham, the most fundamental part of, of what he taught me, you know. You're not buying a stock. You're buying a, you're buying a part ownership in a business. You will do well if the business does well and if you didn't pay a totally silly price. And that's what it's all about. And you ought to buy businesses you understand. Just like if you're buying farms, you ought to buy farms you understand. It, it, it's, it's not complicated. Coca-Cola holds a place in the mind of consumers around the globe. This is many decades in the making. People know about Coca-Cola and they've likely had it before. Many enjoy it and have a positive association with the product. Those people will continue to buy it even if some slightly lower cost alternative pops up. The power of branding is a key competitive advantage for the company. Not only does it help protect market share from competition, but it has a real positive economic impact. The Coca-Cola company benefits from large pricing power, which Buffett explains here. I mean, Coca-Cola's been around since 1886. There's 1.8 billion, 1.8 billion eight-ounce servings of Coca-Cola products sold every day. Now, if you take one penny and get one penny extra, that's $18 million a day. And 18 million times 365 is $6,570,000,000. Million. So annually, $6,570,000,000 million from one penny. Do you think Coca-Cola is worth a penny more than, you know, Joe's Cola? I think so. So, uh, you know, and I've got about 127 years of history that would indicate it. Coca-Cola has been a golden goose for investors. Historically, the product continued to squeeze out more profits per case and ship out more volume year after year. It was a money printing machine leading to reliable profits for shareholders. They used that money to buy back shares and pay dividends. Warren Buffett and his longtime business partner, Charlie Munger, explained this phenomena in the following clip. Clip. Coca-Cola's earnings are very easy to figure it out. Just figure out what they're, you know, what they're earning per case from operations, and you'll see over the years, the earnings per case go up, and the cases go up, and the shares go down. And uh, it doesn't get much more complicated than that. Charlie? You've said it wonderfully. <laughs> I just wish we had more like that. Yeah. Now I know what some of you are thinking, but Zach, that may have been true back then, but less people are drinking Coke today. You would actually be correct. The Golden Goose product is no longer growing at the same rate year after year. Charlie Munger addresses this concern in the following audio clip. As a fair warning, the audio quality is bad, but it's still worth listening to. If you can't deal with it, skip ahead a little bit. Well, that's an easy one. Coke for many decades. The basic product, whole sugar, coke, grew every year. It was like an inevitable march of time. In recent years, whole sugar coke is declining. Now, unfortunately, the Coca-Cola company has a vast distribution business infrastructure and a lot of other products. And so, while wow, Coca-Cola as an individual product is declining some, instead of going up the way it always did before. The rest of the businesses are, on average, rising. So I think Coke is still a pretty strong company and will be a respectable investment, but it's not like it used to be when it was like shooting fish in a barrel. 
The traditional full sugar Coke is not like it used to be. Growth has plateaued with some years declining. However, the brand of Coca-Cola is strong and constantly being used in new product categories, whether it's Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Cherry Coke, or even alcoholic mixed beverages. However, it's important to emphasize that the Coca-Cola company is not just Coca-Cola. Over the decades, they've built a diversified portfolio of beverage brands across many categories. They often refer to themselves as a total beverage company. So what does Coca-Cola's business look like today in 2023? They own over 200 brands worldwide. This is across different categories such as soft drinks, water and hydration, coffee and tea, juices and dairy, and ready-to-drink alcohol. Many of these you will recognize as they are leaders in their categories. If you've never analyzed Coca-Cola's business, some of these will surprise you. In sparkling soft drinks, they have Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Fanta, Fresca, Schweppes, Sprite, Barg's Root Beer, and others. In Waters and Hydration, they own Dasani, Powerade, Smart Water, Topo Chico, Aha, Body Armor, and Vitamin Water. In Coffee and Tea, they own some international brands I can't pronounce, along with Costa Coffee, Fused Teas, Georgia, Gold Peak Tea, and Peace Tea. In Juice and Dairy, they own Fair Life, Minute Maid, Simply, and more. In Alcohol, they've leveraged their existing brands into a new category. This includes Spice Spiked Simply, Topo Chico Hard Seltzer, Jack Daniels with Coca-Cola, Fresca Mixed, and likely more to come. Within each of these brands, there are various products available. The Coca-Cola company is constantly expanding into new verticals. Sometimes they work, and other times they don't. This is the nature of experimentation. Overall, Coca-Cola is still the flagship product and the largest individual contributor to their business. The brand, pricing power, and economic moat is strong. Many of their other brands share similar characteristics, but none as powerful as Coca-Cola. The company's revenues are diversified not only among products, but around the globe. With this understanding, let's analyze Coca-Cola's stock from the perspective of a long-term dividend investor. To do so, I'll be using my stock research tool available at DividendData.com. There is a 14-day free trial, so feel free to try it out and follow along with me as I analyze Coca-Cola stock. The Coca-Cola Coca-Cola Company, ticker symbol KO, is currently trading at a price per share of $55.51. With 4.32 billion shares outstanding, the market cap is $240 billion. The stock price is down around its 52-week low. Since 2020, earnings per share have started to grow again after a long period of stagnation. Based on the trailing 12 months EPS, the current P ratio is 23. That's not cheap for a low-growth company. However, it's substantial substantially more appealing than the near 30 PE it was a few months back. The forward-looking annual dividend per share is $1.84. At current prices, that gives it a dividend yield of 3.32%. The Coca-Cola dividend has over 60 years of consecutive dividend growth. Over the past 10 years, the compound annual growth rate of the dividend sits at 5.09%. This has slowed with the five-year CAGR being 3.36%. The most recent increase was 4.55%. With strong business performance so far in 2023, I'd expect continued dividend growth between 4 and 6%. The Coca-Cola dividend is sustainable, paying out a large percentage of cash to shareholders. This is by design as they are a mature company with limited opportunities to intelligently reinvest in their business. The payout ratio based on free cash flow is between 65 and 80% over the past four years. I would consider this healthy for Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola balance sheet is reasonable reasonably strong. They have $14.2 billion in cash on hand, with $40.1 billion in total debt, bringing net debt to $25.9 billion. 2022 annual free cash flow generation was $9.5 billion. Ultimately, you are investing in Coca-Cola to get this cash distributed to shareholders. As I mentioned, most of this is paid out via dividend. They still will do share buybacks, although far less than prior decades. This largely stopped from 2019 to 2022. However, it's starting again lightly in 2023. The biggest risk at Coca-Cola from the perspective of an investor is low growth. Revenue per share has slightly negative growth over the past 10 years. A portion of this can be attributed to a saga of events where they acquired and then divested from their bottling operations. Free cash flow per share is growing at a 2.35% 10-year CAGR and 11.62% 5-year CAGR. 
year. Growth is starting to accelerate, which is a positive sign. Margins remain high with around 60% gross margins and 25% net margins. This is industry leading, being propped up by Coca-Cola. It really needs to be emphasized what an amazing business that is. For context, PepsiCo has far smaller margins at 53% gross margins and 10% net margins. When it comes to profitability, Coke's beverage business is far better than PepsiCo's portfolio of beverages. Coca-Cola is a one-of-a-kind product that delivers one-of-a-kind profits. It's truly unrivaled. However, that killer product line will not see the growth it did in decades past. That said, it will continue to be a reliable cash cow. It will allow the Coca-Cola company to pay investors with generous dividends and invest in new product categories. I think Coca-Cola has proven to be a great investment for Warren Buffett. I don't blame him for saying that he'd never sell a share. But do I think it's a good stock to buy right now for your dividend portfolio? Maybe. If your main focus is earning reliable, growing dividends now and over the next decade, then yes. 2023 may be a good time to add as the stock is at one of the better yields on costs since 2021. However, if you're looking to optimize for total return over the long term, you may find better places to invest. Personally, I sold my Coke stock in fall 2022 when the tech stocks crashed. I raised cash and put a bunch into Microsoft. In my mind, that was a far better investment opportunity. Coca-Cola stock trades at a premium valuation due to its high quality, reliable business model. However, I think its low growth rate makes it overvalued and more risky. But don't blindly listen to my opinion. Be sure to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Make sure to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if this video provided value. Sign up for DividendData.com if you want to use the research tool I've been showing throughout. Thanks for watching. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. Of course, I could buy the world a Coke, but I'm not sure my shareholders would go for that.